Do we have to die to live? Oh yeah. A thousand deaths. Because imagine. And people are buying your books. I know, but you know what? Um, yeah, because rebirth, right? And I'm not talking just in a Christian metaphor here. Um, I don't care if you're agnostic or Muslim or Jewish. Um, rebirth. There has to be, we have to bury things and we have to grieve them and they have to, they have to go away for good. That's death. And then something new is born of it. But yeah, absolutely. Except yeah. the revolution can come through death to get the rebirth. But yeah. yeah. No, yeah. And so. let me tell you, rebirth's not easy. And death is not easy. But what does forgiveness have to do with resurrection or rebirth? You know, when I was writing The Gifts of Imperfection, um, I thought forgiveness would be one of the 10 guideposts for the gifts because it's such a huge issue. And I had already turned in the draft of it, and then I was doing some interviews around forgiveness just to make sure because it's such a big thing, a big topic, and it's so hard and it's so tender. Um, and those interviews that I did blew my idea of what forgiveness was out of the water. It didn't fit at all with what I had put forward. So I pulled it back and I've been working for a decade trying to figure out forgiveness, but I could never, you know, as a qualitative researcher, we look for saturation, meaning we keep getting the same answers over and over as we interview people to the point where we believe that it's a valid and reliable answer um, and that it's broad enough to capture everyone's experiences. And so I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to solve forgiveness. And then one day I was You woke at, up one day trying to solve forgiveness? I woke up, no, I spent a decade trying to solve it. Oh, but one day, I, yeah, it's a lot of mornings, but one day I did solve it. Um, I was at church and I was listening to Joe Reynolds, who is the, he's an Episcopal priest, tell, talking, telling stories about forgiveness and his experience doing pastoral counseling. And he said, in order for forgiveness to happen, something has to die. And I was like, I literally put my hand over my face. I was like, oh my God, the one concept or construct that I had left out that was, it was the reason why forgiveness was never whole in my work was grief. The reason why forgiveness is so hard is because in order for us to forgive, something has to die and we have to grieve something. Um, and so I went back into the data, had a couple of doctoral students with me and we started looking and it was the grief all through. It was the grief. It was, you know, he was telling the story about a couple where the, the guy had had an affair and they were just, they knew that one of them wanted the marriage to end, but he couldn't let go of the shame and she couldn't let him let go of the shame and she couldn't let go of the rage. And, you know, Joe just said, you're going to have to bury and kill off this marriage as you know it today um, and grieve the loss of what this was in order for something new to be born. It's not ever going to be the same again. And I have goosebumps telling it. And when I went back, and even if it's forgiveness of someone you care about says something really hurtful about you, you have to bury the idea that that person doesn't have the capacity to hurt you or that wouldn't hurt you. And then something new has to be born. Um, and maybe it's deeper and richer and more beautiful, or maybe it's not going to be born. And maybe there's just a death and a loss. Um, but the people who've truly forgiven, and then what was crazy, I don't even write about this in the book, but what was crazy is the Tutus, um, Archbishop Tutu and Reverend Tutu, his daughter, sent me an early copy of their book on forgiveness. And I'm reading it on a plane, and I, they sent it to me, I think, because they quote some of my work about shame. But as I'm reading it, I'm like, oh my God. They don't say something has to die, but they talk about the grief that's inherently important in forgiveness. And they talk about the truth and reconciliation in South Africa, and they talk about what they've seen around forgiveness, and it just fit. 
I mean, I make the recommendation of their book in Rising Strong and say it's one of the most important books I've read in my life. Um, but grief is an inherent part of forgiveness. Sometimes we just have to kill off and bury being right. And the power that comes from being, and the juice that we get from being right in order for forgiveness to happen. Um, which means the willingness to, to kill something off or bury something and grieve it makes being forgiven the ultimate act of love. Right? Yeah, so it like, yeah. It's powerful. The center of the universe that very close is <laughs> This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and verse 10. Listen for the word of God. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, three days' walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. May God bless the reading of these words. Thank you, Clark. Let us pray. <clears throat> May the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. We humans are forever dreaming of an easy kind of love. We dream of romantic love as sweet as candy hearts, as fluffy as a stuffed animal, and as simple as a fairy tale. We keep searching for perfect friends who agree with us on everything and who never push our buttons. We hope that writing checks to charity and sharing woke social media posts will count as love for neighbor. But this kind of love asks little of us. Deep love, by contrast, asks much of us. In fact, as Brene Brown describes in our centering words, this kind of love leads to death, to the cross. And if you're brave enough, further, down to the grave, beyond to rebirth. You see, that's why God had to send Jesus. Jesus came to earth because we needed to see for ourselves what love does. If we hadn't seen it for ourselves, invariably we would have oversimplified love into rainbows and candy hearts. Because we humans are so afraid of hard things. And real love, my friends, is a beautiful but a hard thing. Today we're going to talk about something for our second Sunday of our series, Love Does, that love does and is very hard. That is, love apologizes, forgives, reconciles. And we witness this reconciling love in the story of Jesus. Christ's love was always personal and never backed away from death, rebirth, suffering. Jesus didn't just preach lofty words to crowds about loving our neighbor in the abstract tithing and praying. No. Instead, Jesus gathered a real ragtag crew under his wing to love on. 
Now these friends would bicker, complain, push his buttons, and in the end, they would betray him. Even so, Jesus knew them, he forgave them, and he kept on loving them always, even at their worst. And Jesus does that for you, friends, showing us what love does. But deep love didn't begin with Jesus. In our scripture lectionary reading this morning, we have another true love story from the little book of Jonah. Jonah is another story just about what love does. If you know this story, it's a fantastical adventure involving a near shipwreck, a giant whale, and a voracious worm. But you're going to need a little more context than that to understand our reading today. So here goes. Our story begins with God calling to Jonah, telling him to prophesy to the city of Nineveh. Jonah, however, wants nothing to do with this assigned mission. You see, Jonah is a Jewish national, and Nineveh is the capital of Assyrian wickedness. He wouldn't be caught dead in Nineveh ministering to those vile Gentiles known for their cruelty. So instead, Jonah decides to run from God, literally. He flees in the opposite direction to Tarshish, comically believing that he can hide from God Almighty. Soon after, one perilous night at sea, Jonah's fellow sailors toss everything overboard in an effort to keep their ship afloat. But when that doesn't work, they finally throw Jonah overboard at his request. And the seas immediately calm. Now here comes the part that you probably remember from Sunday school. This is the part that Jonah is then swallowed up by a whale. Picture Pinocchio inside the belly of that whale in the classic Disney movie. Deep, deep down in the belly of this whale, Jonah prays for three days and God responds as love does with mercy. And the whale unceremoniously vomits Jonah up onto dry land. Now, no sooner has Jonah drip dried of baleen bile that God calls him a second time. Jonah, go to Nineveh. At last, Jonah realizes he's not getting out of this one. So reluctantly, he trudges off to be part of God's plan of mercy and salvation to the vilest people on earth. Once there, Jonah preaches the most lackluster sermon you've ever heard. It consists of only eight words, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. Not very inspiring. What's more, even though it takes three full days to walk across Nineveh, Jonah preaches this awful sermon for one day only. But despite this, every Ninevite, from the small to the tall, responds with incredible alacrity. Immediately, the king sits down in ash and proclaims the severest fast. Everyone dons an itchy, ugly sackcloth. What our lectionary excludes is that even their animals fasted and wore a sackcloth. If you can imagine the hilarity of hungry sheep wearing little sackcloth outfits, you realize how seriously these Ninevites were taking their apology. Ironically, it is the Ninevites, known for their cruelty, who are showing the reader what love does. Love repents its wrongs. And so in response, Yahweh, who is love itself, also does what love does. God shows them, as Brene Brown says, the ultimate act of love, forgiveness. Forgiveness without hesitation, without conditions. 
God forgives the Ninevites and spares them. Now then, upon seeing God's mercy to the Assyrians, our protagonist goes off to sulk under a tree. God's forgiveness just doesn't work as Jonah believes it ought. He argues that God's mercy should have first gone to the Israelites, God's chosen people who have suffered much. Instead, God pours mercy upon these crooked Ninevites. Jonah reminds God that this is why he fled to Tarshish in the first place. He moans that he knew all along God would be gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He tells God, if you're not going to kill the Ninevites for their wickedness, then just kill me now. But God didn't forgive the Ninevites for their righteousness. And God didn't forgive Jonah in the belly of the whale because he was obedient. God forgives because not who we are, not because what we've done. God forgives because of who God is, because what Christ has done. God is love and reconciliation is what love does. Now, what does this fantastic story mean for you and me, my friends? Well, it's really quite simple. To sustain love in this life, you will be asked to apologize, to forgive, to reconcile. You will even be asked, as Jesus says on his famous Sermon on the Mount, to do it 70 times seven. Now, let me be clear, this is not the kind of forgiveness that allows abuse. This is not the kind of forgiveness that ignores the lessons of the past. No, instead, this is a forgiveness that frees our own hearts from anger and bitterness, making room for more peace, more joy, more understanding. But in order for that to happen, as Brene Brown says, first, something has to die. And there's always a grief in that. Maybe our hope that the past could have been better has to die. Maybe we need to bury the idea that our beloved couldn't or wouldn't hurt us. Whatever it is, death is a prerequisite for reconciliation which is why it is such hard work. We have to sit in the belly of the whale for three days. We have to lie in the tomb before rebirth because east of Eden, love is unsustainable without rebirth. So finally, I ask you, my friends at home today, are you running from God's call to reconciliation like Jonah? What would you have to kill off in your life to make room for forgiveness? What would you have to bury before you could apologize like the Ninevites? What would have to die in order for you to complete Christ's work of reconciliation to live out what love does. Amen.